Hello, Clinic Review family. It's Dr. Sharon with Clinic Reviews, the very best NCLEX review in the entire universe, in my opinion. Uh, sorry, I didn't upload earlier this week. I haven't been feeling very well and I don't make my videos ahead of time. So I didn't have anything to like upload because I never know what I'm going to talk about, right? Like I decide the day of what I'm going to talk about, depending on like what I've been seeing and what I've been thinking about and what I'm working with my students on. So today we're going to talk about skin and it's fundamental, but we're going to really focus on using common sense. We're going to talk about vocabulary because skin is a lot of vocabulary and common sense and just general principles of skin and skin breakdown. Okay. So thank you to all our channel members. You're the best. If you're interested in a channel membership, you can, we have two levels. You can look into that. And if you are interested in paying me to do something with you, you can pay me to do next gen tutoring. I actually have um, I have a next gen tutoring almost every week, not exactly every week, but almost every week. And you can go to uh, Clinic Reviews. You want to go to the to the website? Not it's not a YouTube thing. So go to ClinicReviews.com uh, and you can sign up for that. Mark does it as well. You can also sign up for our online on demand. Um, and clicks review there. You get the yellow and the blue book with that, by the way. All right, let's go ahead and get started. These are not super complicated questions, but these are questions you have to get right on the NCLEX, you know, if you're going to pass. So let's go ahead and do this. On initial assessment of a patient, the nurse notices an area of redness over the right trochanter. That when pressed lightly does not blanch, what does this assessment cue indicate to the nurse? The presence of an infection in the area, the presence of a stage one pressure injury, an allergic reaction to the sheets, the need to apply cold compress to reduce inflammation. And let, okay, so I always read the question, read the answers again, read the question again. And I do this in my videos as well so that you get in the habit of doing that. Um, it is not helpful to you if you read the questions and answers too fast. Even if you think you know the answer, I strongly recommend reading the question, the answers, and the question again. On initial assessment of a patient, the nurse notices an area of redness over the right trochanter that when pressed lightly does not blanch. All right, the right trochanter is of no consequence. It doesn't matter where it is. It's, an, it's a non-blanching redness. Um, and non-blanching redness is a stage one pressure injury. Okay. So that is, uh, and I, I actually put this here. So they could show you a picture, but it doesn't matter if they show you a picture or if they give it to you in words and they ask you what it is. Um, a stage one pressure injury is non blanchment erythema, but the skin is intact. Stage two, the skin is open, but the wound base is a variation of normal. Stage three, the, the wound, the skin is open. The wound base is yellow or cream. And in stage four, the skin is open. The wound base is red or white, which is muscle or bone. And then non-stageable is when it has a black eschar covering it. So you would call that non-stageable. So if you don't know these, you have to know it. The probability of getting a state uh, pressure injury question is very, very high on the NCLEX. So you have to know these. And you might go, well, what's the point of learning the words if they're going to show me a picture? All right, you Google uh, stage three pressure injury. Look at them. They're all, they may all look different, but they're all going to have open skin and the wound base is going to be yellow or cream. So this is the consistency between all of them. And this is what you would expect to, um, to see either in a picture, these words would accurately describe any picture you looked at, or they can describe, they'll use these words. Oh, that's a lot of words. Okay. Four days after abdominal surgery, the patient is getting out of bed and feels something pop in his abdominal wound. An increase in the amount of drainage from the wound is seen and further examination shows that the sutured incision is now partially open with tissue protruding from the wound, which are the primary or priority nursing interventions select all that apply. Apply sterile strips to close the wound edges, cover the wound with saline moistened gauze, apply a binder to pull the wound edges together, and provide support to the edges. Notify the surgeon, allow the area to be exposed to air until all of the drainage has stopped. All right, let's read the question again. Four days after abdominal surgery, the patient is getting out of bed and feels something pop in his abdominal wound. An increase in the amount of drainage from the wound is seen, and further examination shows that the sutured incision is now partially open with tissue protruding from the wound. 
What is the priority nursing intervention? Select all that apply. All right. This is not something nurses can do something about with their own, uh, their own judgment. So what we have to do is we have to call the surgeon. So that's the first thing I know we have to do. So I'm definitely going to go with D for sure. D is in dog. Now let's look at the other ones. Apply stereo strips to close the wound edges. Now, when you have, this is a select all that apply question. When you have multiple answers that all say the same thing in a SATA question, either they're all wrong or they're all right. And A and B, no, I'm sorry, A and C are saying the same thing. Apply stereo strips to close the wound and apply a binder to close the wound are two different thing, two different ways of closing the wound. So they're both closing the wound. So, so the question is, is it my job to close the wound, whether it was stary strips or with a binder? And I'm not comfortable with that. I, I don't know what damage that could cause. That's not my scope of practice. So I'm not comfortable with that. Now, what I do know about wound care, here's a fundamental principle about wound care. Open wounds need to be kept moist and Closed wounds need to be kept dry. So while the sutures were in, that's a closed wound. So I got to keep that dry, clean and dry. But open wounds, because we have tissues that are normally not exposed, but now they're exposed, I have to keep that moist. So open wounds have to be kept moist. Closed wounds have to be clean and dry. And I mean, open wounds have to be kept clean and moist. You know what I'm saying? They all have to be kept clean. But open is moist and closed is dry. So if that's the case, then it makes sense to cover the wound with a saline moistened gauze because that's a fundamental principle, y'all. That is, that is always right. When I say something is fundamental, it is always right to keep an open wound moist. And it's always right to keep a closed wound dry. So B has to be true. If I'm going with just fundamental principles, B has to be true. And A and C are saying the same thing. And, and I don't love either one of them. So I either have to pick them both or I'm not going to pick either one of them. So I'm not going to pick either one of them. I'm just not comfortable with that. Allow the area to be exposed to air until all the drainage has stopped. Okay, that's not something we ever do. That's not something I'm comfortable with at all. It's not something we do. So B and D if I'm going to go with what I know fundamentally is true, I'm going to have to go with B and D. So um, those are the correct answers. So I'm I'm using common sense and and my gut. I use my gut here, right? Like that, that's closing something with stereo strips. Have I ever done that before? Have I ever been told to do that? No. Have I ever been told to close wound edges with a binder? No. Like I've never done those things. Why would I do it now, right? So common sense, my gut, and fundamental principles of wound care. All right, next question. Which features are characteristic of a closed drainage system, such as a Jackson Pratt drain? And you might say, well, I don't know what a Jackson Pratt drain is. Okay, um, I'm, I'm going to show you on the next slide, but let's just say you don't know that. So drains, what do we know about drains? Well, drains are almost always put in in surgery. And we measure the output from those drains. They go home with the drains. Let's see what the other answers are here. Works by gravity, provides for early discharge, usually is inserted in surgery, reduces the amount of antibiotics required, allows for accurate measurement of wound drainage. All right, which features are characteristic of a closed drainage system such as Jackson Pratt drain? Works by gravity, works by gravity. Not you. I'm not familiar with drains that are surgically placed to work by gravity. Usually there's some sort of a suction method associated with that. Usually that's what, and, and I know the NCLEX um, works with general principles, not exceptions. So I don't think I'm going to pick gravity provides for an early discharge. All right. If it provided for an early discharge, then we would be putting drains in everybody and we don't do that. So that doesn't make sense to me. If I just use my common sense, that doesn't make any sense to me. Usually is inserted in surgery. So I know that to be true. People come out of surgery with drains all the time. Reduces the amount of antibiotics required. Again, if it would reduce the amount of antibiotics required, everyone would have a drain and they don't. So um, B and D don't make sense to me as far as just common sense. When I mean common sense, I mean things that I've heard, things that I've seen, 
um, just common sense. Like, have I ever heard that before? No. Why would I, then why would I pick it? Allows for accurate measurement of wound drainage. Now that I know is true. Um, because if all you've got is a drain, uh, draining into, a a dressing, right? If you've got drainage coming out, the incision is just draining into a dressing. You can't measure, but if it's draining into a, a drain itself that you can measure. So I know that's true. So, so I know C and E are true with this. Now, if you didn't know what a Jackson Pratt is, it's one of those bulb suction and it doesn't show it compressed right now because the lid is off. Um, and it's going into the person and, and then it's, uh, pinned to their shirt so it doesn't pull on the insertion site and it's sutured in underneath the dressing there's like one or two sutures there and then uh, it has a cat little cap on it that's actually open right now it looks like so what you do is you just compress the bulb and you put the cap back in and then it's got that compression so it actually it it pulls with that compression it pulls and as it as it begins to fill that bulb starts to open up again and you know you have to empty it when it's all the way open and it's pulled everything out it's going to pull out and then you and then you have to um, drain it people can go home with these um, mastectomy patients often have two on each side if they have a double mastectomy they'll have two on each side of their chest when they come out of surgery um, many, many surgical procedures, if they um, do a lot of cutting and the surgery is very long, um, it's very common to have a lot of drainage and you don't want that just settling under the skin and you don't want it pull, coming out of the, the incision, right? You want the incision to stay dry because the incision is closed. You want it to stay clean and dry. So you don't want it coming out of there and you don't want it collecting under the skin. So you put a drain in so you can collect it. And as that drainage starts to go re be reduced, um, they eventually take it out. So that's uh, a Jackson Pratt drain. And that's pretty fundamental. All right. You can see a question like this on the NCLEX as a next gen question. Um, I don't know if you'll see it as a standalone question. I think you're more likely to see it in the um, in the case study, this would be a question in the case study. The nurse is planning care for a patient with urinary and fecal incontinence. For each potential nursing intervention, specify whether the intervention is indicated, non-essential, or contraindicated for the care of the patient. Now, you can see a question like this in a case study, but you actually um, often don't even have to look at the chart to figure it out. Now, in this case, you don't have to look at the chart, obviously, because there's no chart to look at. But even if it is, well, the way you answer this, the way you decide if it's contraindicated is you say, what would contraindicate something? So let me start at the beginning here. So we're going to go through each one. Well, let me read them first. And then I'll read the question again. Changing the adult brief every eight hours, cleansing frequently with hot water and strong soap, using an incontinence cleanser, frequent position changes, placing the patient in contact precautions, applying a moisture barrier ointment. Okay, so those are pretty basic basic interventions for someone with incontinence. Nurse is planning care for patients with urinary and fecal incontinence. For each potential nursing intervention, specify whether the intervention is indicated, non-essential, or contraindicated. So it could be non-essential, but not contraindicated. So let's talk about this. So changing adult brief every eight hours is indicated. Okay, changing an adult brief every eight hours is indicated. So what you have to do here is you have to say, I'm only going to change it every eight hours because it doesn't say every eight hours in PRN. If it said eight, every eight hours in PRN, then I go, oh, well, then I can change it PRN. But this says changing it every eight hours. And it doesn't say only every eight hours, but that's what it's, that is, it doesn't have the word only, but that is what it's saying. So changing, it would be true that I would change the adult brief every eight hours, which means I'm only going to change their brief three times a day. And I say, well, that's not often enough. I mean, I have to change, at least I have to do eight hours in PRN and usually it's four hours in PRN and sometimes it's two hours in PRN, depending on how incontinent they are. Like you kind of got to figure it out, but eight hours is definitely too long. So I say, well, that's not indicated. And in fact, if I only did it every eight hours, have you ever had a patient that you didn't get to them until it'd been like five hours or six hours and they're soaked and their skin is moist and you're like, this is not good. So every eight hours is actually, not only is it non-essential, it's contraindicated. So, so I, I say, because every eight hours is not often enough. So I would actually say that's contraindicated because you have to have, if you're going to say it's contraindicated, you have to have a reason for it. 
So don't just say, well, no, that's not what I would want to do. Well, okay, so that's not essential if that's not what you would want to do. But if it's actually contraindicated, there has to be a reason. And it's contraindicated because every eight hours is not often enough. So I'm going to say contraindicated for the adult brief every eight hours. Cleansing. So cleansing frequently with hot water and strong soap is indicated. Cleansing frequently with hot water and strong soap. Now, in my experience, we use gentle soap, especially when we're cleansing frequently. The next one is, the next option is using an incontinence cleanser. So in a sad question, when I have two answers that say opposite things, usually I have to choose one of them. And this is, for all intents and purposes, the opposite thing. So I would either clean it with hot water and a strong soap, or I would use an incontinence cleanser. And I definitely like incontinence cleanser better. So I would say an incontinence cleanser is indicated. Now the question is frequent with hot water and a strong soap. Is that non-essential or is it contraindicated? So hot water, I don't want to burn them. Don't want to burn myself either. And a strong soap could actually frequently use, could dry the skin out, and it could cause some chafing, which I don't like, right? We use moist, we use uh, lotions and stuff to try to keep the skin in good shape. And it seems like using hot water and a strong soap is the opposite of that. So since I'm going to choose using an incontinence cleanser as indicated, I'm going to say cleansing frequently in hot water and a strong soap is contraindicated. All right, frequent position changes. Well, that seems good. Okay. That seems very good. That, like that, I would pick that. That's fundamental, right? We do frequent position changes. That's, that's indicated. Placing the patient in contact precautions. All right. <clears throat> Urinary and fecal incontinence. So the CDC says that the only reason you have to put someone with fecal incontinence in contact precautions is if it's so bad that it cannot be contained. So they get up to walk to the bathroom and it's dripping on the floor as they walk along, or it, uh, they have so much out that it comes out around their depends, right? Or maybe they're playing in it or something like that. And so it does, and it doesn't say that's the problem. So don't say, well, it could be. Nope, nope, nope. If you say could, you're about ready to answer it wrong. So no, it couldn't be y'all. It couldn't be. Not, not unless they tell you it is. So since, since there's no evidence that the fecal incontinence cannot be contained, then I would simply say placing them in contact precautions is not essential. It's not contraindicated. It's not going to hurt anybody. See, contraindicated means there has to be damage to somebody. But it's just not essential. It's not going to hurt anybody, but it's not essential. Apply your moisture barrier ointment. Well, yeah, we do that all the time, right? Moisture barrier ointments. It's like frequent position changes. Of course, we're going to do that. So the correct answers are here. So remember, if it's indicated, a lot of these things you go, well, sure, that's okay. But if you go, is it really indicated or is it just not essential? Like a contact precautions. And then contraindicated, there has to be some harm. So don't choose contraindicated unless you have some idea of what harm it could cause, okay? Five, based on knowledge of areas at greatest risk for development of a pressure injury in the bedridden patient, the nurse identifies which position to minimize this risk. 30 degree side lying, sitting with the head of the bed elevated 75 degrees, 90 degree side lying, lying supine with the bed flat at all times. Based on knowledge of areas at greatest risk for development of pressure injury in the bedridden patient, the nurse identifies which position to minimize this risk. Well, what is the greatest area of greatest risk for skin breakdown with bedridden patients? So I would say the coccyx is and the heels. The coccyx and the heels, if I had to pick them. So I do not like elevating the head of the bed, either 75 degrees or 90 degrees. I don't like either one of them. So I'm crossing off B and C. So now I say, well, would it be better to be a 30 degree side lying or lying supine with the head of the bed flat at all times? Okay. I don't think, actually, I don't think that's saying head of the bed 30 degrees. I think they're saying 30 degrees off the bed in the side lying position. And that, that actually is the appropriate amount. If they give you a number, uh, how much off the bed, it's an angle of supposed to be an angle of 30 degrees. So they don't have to be all the way on their side. They should be 30 degrees off the bed. And maybe some of you work at a hospital where they actually have wedges that are 30 degree angled wedges that you can use to put under people that keeps them in that side lying position. Um, <clears throat> lying supine with the head of the bed flat, um, that's not horrible, but it's not, it's not protecting their coccyx and their heels, which I said were the most highest risk. So 30 degree side lying is the only one that protects the coccyx and the heels. So 
I'm going to have to go with that one. A patient who suffered a stroke is unable to maintain his position while seated in a chair without sliding down. We've all seen that happen. His physician has ordered him to be up in a chair for part of the day. What does the nurse recognize as the patient's greatest risk factor for development of pressure injuries? Okay, we've all seen that. Moisture from incontinence, nutritional deficiencies, pressure and shear, or aging. Okay, a patient who suffered a stroke is unable to maintain his position while seated in a chair without sliding down. His physician has ordered him to be up in a chair for part of the day. What does the nurse recognize as the greatest risk factor for development of pressure injuries? So y'all don't pick an answer that doesn't have anything to do with the question. What do we have in the question? We have stroke. We don't know his age. We don't know if it's a man or a woman. So we have someone who's a stroke and slides. So moisture isn't anywhere in the question. Do I think he might be incontinent? He very well might be, but I can't say that he is because it's not in the question. Does it say he's not eating? It doesn't say that. Does it say he's got shear and pressure? It sure does, because sliding down is shear. That's what shear is, sliding across things. And then aging, it doesn't tell me his, his age, so I can't pick it. So I have to pick pressure and shear. And what I want you to understand is all four of these are risk factors for pressure injuries. They're all risk factors for pressure injuries. So I would not be able to pick one over the other. If it was just a general, if it didn't tell me anything about the patient, it, if it said, which of the following is, it, are, is a risk factor for pressure injuries? And it, I didn't have a patient. I couldn't pick one because they're all equally risk factors. But since we have a scenario where the guy is actually sliding or the woman is sliding down the chair, I could pick one. Seven, a patient has a stage three pressure injury. Remember stage three, the skin is open and the wound base is yellow or white. Which food would be most beneficial to improving the healing process? Food high in vitamin D, whole grain carbohydrates, high calorie, high protein drink, food high in fat and water content. All right, patient has stage three pressure injury. So I'm trying to, re, uh, so we're down into the muscle. Remember it's, uh, and I'm sorry, we're not down in the muscle. Stage four is muscle. Uh, stage three is into the fat layer. So it's whiter cream. Um, but we do have to regrow tissue. So we have to regrow skin and everything. And, and what do we have to have in order to regrow tissue? All right. We have to have protein y'all. We have to have protein. Um, I don't know if you've ever looked at your patient's albumin levels or pre albumin levels, but if their albumin is below two, they cannot heal. Did you hear me? If their albumin level is below two, they literally cannot heal. They will not heal. It doesn't matter how much time you give them. It's not going to heal. They don't have enough protein. That's why we look at albumin levels. And that's why people's albumin levels start to fall or pre-albumin levels are a little, fall a little bit earlier than an albumin level. If they start to fall, we got to give them some kind of supplement or they literally are not going to heal. So the only one that has anything about protein in it is C. Vitamin D is not a protein. Carbohydrates are not proteins and fat and water are not proteins. The only one that's protein is there. And the only thing, we, by the way, of the things there that we get calories from, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats are the only things we get calories from. So B, C, and D are my only options. And so I'm going with the protein one because we have to have proteins. Albumin is a protein. Look at your patient's albumin level next time you're in the hospital and see uh, what it is. Which patient is at highest risk for impaired wound healing? 22-year-old with a pelvic fracture incurred, incurred in a motor vehicle accident. A 49-year-old with a history of smoking two packs a day who just had abdominal surgery. 72-year-old with diabetes and cardiovascular disease who had surgical repair of a broken hip. 90-year-old with no chronic health conditions with a small blistered burn on the hand. Okay, which patient is at highest risk for impaired wound healing? So we know their ages. So based on their age alone, who's at highest risk? Well, the 90-year-old is at highest risk. Second highest is a 72-year-old. So the 90-year-old, the only risk factor they have is their health. I mean, their age, sorry. The only risk factor they have is their age. They have no chronic health conditions. And it, so it doesn't tell me they're malnourished. Don't tell me anything. So it's just, it's a healthy 90-year-old. So the only risk factor I know of of D is their age. One risk factor. The 72-year-old is age is a risk factor. Diabetes is a risk factor. Okay, that's two because diabetes impairs wound healing. And cardiovascular disease is a comorbid condition. So they actually have three risk factors. So I'm going to cross off D because C is a higher risk. Now, 
A, I'm crossing off because they're young and they don't have any comorbid conditions. I'm crossing them off. A is, and then a 49-year-old, well, they're younger than the 72-year-old. So 72-year-old beats the 49-year-old smoking. Oh, that's bad. If we were to say who's got more risk factors, and this is the way you answer the question, by the way, when they ask risk for, you say, what are the risk factors? Do I know the risk factors and who has the most risk factors? As much as I, I like to pick smoking as the worst risk factor, it's not the worst risk factor in a question like this, okay? Because that's not what they're asking. You want to know how many risk factors. So B, the 49 is not really old enough to be concerned about it. So they have one smoking as a risk factor. Maybe, I mean, they're not 20, so maybe a, a half a risk factor with 49. But the 72-year-old has three. So if we count risk factors, C has the most risk factors. So I have to pick them. So this is really important for you to read because I know y'all know risk factors. I know you do, but you don't, if you don't know how to answer the question, you could still get it wrong. Okay. So count risk factors. When they give you people say, who's the highest risk? You go count the risk factors. That's how you do it. That's how you answer the question. Here's a vocabulary question. Which best describes a fresh surgical wound that has been closed with sutures or staples, making the two edges of the wound meet? So, do you know, the word approximated, proliferated, debrided, and tertiary intention. When they, when they meet, fresh surgical wound that has been closed with sutures, making the two edges meet. It doesn't matter how they're closed. The two edges meet. What is that called? That's called approximated. If you don't know that, you have to know that, y'all. Remember, vocabulary, vocabulary, vocabulary. I'm not talking about definitions of disease processes. I'm just talking about everyday vocabulary that's used, okay? How to describe things. Vocabulary, vocabulary, vocabulary. Mark Klimek says, as long as I've known him, the number one reason people fail in clicks is vocabulary. Now, just to let you know, since this is really a, a video about skin, is the Braden scale assessment for the risk of skin breakdown has six components to it. Friction, moisture. Oh, why do I have two frictions? Uh, I don't know. Uh, friction, moisture, activity, mobility, nutrition, and age, I think might be on there too. I think I might've messed that up. Sorry. I think it might be age, moisture, activity, mobility, nutrition and friction shear. So anyway, these are the risk factors. So uh, for skin breakdown. So these are the things when they, um, not for not for failing to heal. That's not what I'm talking about. The, the last question was, um, this one was about impaired wound healing. Impaired wound healing is different than risk for skin breakdown. Impaired wound healing is they already have a wound. Is it going to heal? Skin breakdown is where you have you have skin that's intact, and because of of risk factors they have, it now is breaking down. It, we didn't we didn't break it down; it just broke down. So when you look at at risk factors for that, you're like, okay, am I moving them up and down? How old are they? And are we moving them up and down? Are they moist? Are they incontinent? What's their activity? Are they able to move themselves in bed? Do they get up and walk? Or are they bedridden? Uh, <clears throat> what's their mobility? And are they activities? Do they get out of bed? Mobilities? Can they turn themselves in bed easily? And then nutrition, remember, they have to have enough protein, look at their albumin, and, and then friction shear, are they scooting around and better? Are we having to use like a draw sheet to move them up? Or can they move themselves up? Or do they stand up and then get back into bed and all that, right? So these are the things that you need to be thinking about um, when you think about preventing skin breakdown. You're looking at moisture, particularly moisture, nutrition, mobility, activity, and friction. You can't change age. It's a risk factor, but you can't change it. These are the things you can change or have some uh, effect on. All right. Well, thank you for watching that. I hope you had, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope I didn't ramble too much. I'm on cold medicine. So it's making me a little loopy. Today is September 21st, 2023. And we do have a um, live stream tonight for channel members. So if you are a channel member or you want to be a channel member, you can watch that. It will be recorded and placed, so you don't have to watch it live if you don't want to. But you can if you want to um, ask me questions or talk to me during the live stream. Okay. So we hope you have a great rest of your day and I'll see you later. Bye.